Welcome to Real Tech for Real People, episode 136. This is Tony Pittman with the stars of the show, Steve and Chris Brady. I snuck it in there. You didn't even know. <laughs> you know, Tony, we're cheering you on. We do have Chris back with us. It's good to have you, Chris. Welcome. It's good to be Enjoy back, Chris. gentlemen. Thank you very much. And, and just for you, Chris, I tried to make sure that we have Daring Fireball to, uh, to in, insult, I mean, talk about. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Stop the show. Stop the show. Stop the show. Newsflash. Newsflash. No, not really. John Gruber has lost his mind. Well, that's not new news. What's he up to, What's he up to these days? <laughs> oh, you know, Chris and I were talking before the show about this, and I've just been catching this on my pick of the week. I've been seeing this come through on what I'm going to get to for my pick of the week. John Gruber as Daring Fireball. He, I don't know, Chris. Tony, would you say he's kind of an Apple fanboy? Yeah, well, for sure. Yeah, he makes his living on it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and he, but he's more than just a guy who knows about Apple. I think he's a guy that, uh, I mean, Fireball is about right. He, he's a firebrand, and and he's saying that this whole five hundred dollars a share thing, Tony, that we were talking about last episode. You know that Apple's now responding by giving dividends and this and the other thing. He says it's all about the fact that several big institutional investors had put a short on the stock at five hundred dollars a share, and they talked it down and talked it down and talked it down until it got there so that they could make money. It's a conspiracy of all conspiracies. That's mm -hmm. Gruber right there. Hard to believe. Hard to believe because you know when a stock. Uh, has been going like apples. I, I think the more simple thing to do is make money by just uh, buying more of it as it goes up. You know, it seems like you know an awful, awful, di difficult to believe conspiracy that they all conspired to bring it back down. You know, when it when they were all obviously doing well with the with the run the stock was on in the first place. That's strange, isn't it? But yeah. but you know, so that I had to put that at the top of the news because it's it's just like this guy. You know, I can handle fanboyism, which his, uh, there's my autofocus. I can handle fanboyism where he's, he's kind of saying, you know, well, this is the best phone, and look, they sold 56%, and it was 54%. Those people who said it was 48% are insane. Fine, got it. You're, you're an Apple fanboy here. But, but this one just really seemed to, to take the tasty cake, which, you know, nobody else can have anymore. <laughs> is Tasty yeah. Cake Hostess? Oh, no, you're right. It's not. That's its own brand name. I'm, I was thinking Twinkie K. He takes Twinkies. Well, he takes you, the just, you just scared the whole Philadelphia area with that. Tasty Cake's still around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My apologies, Philadelphia. <laughs> well, guys, you all are, are, are business folks, and I'm not. I don't pretend to be. But um, and, and, of course, the stock did come down. I think it's saying it's 12% um, or something now. I mean, it's, uh, it's still up. Golly, isn't it up something like 15 or 16 percent year to date? But the, what was the deal with the earnings call? So it wasn't what investors expected, which I always think is interesting. I mean, that would be like me grading students saying, I know that you're really smart. And so even though you got all the questions right, I expected you to get all the questions right and give me new questions with better answers. You know, well, I mean, the so interesting thing is, you know, uh, by all the articles I've read, they actually did beat the consensus. Analyst experts, yeah, uh, analyst estimates, you know. But the the thing that usually happens here is yeah, this is all a big game, right? Companies that are doing well always seem to just beat the analyst estimates by a penny, right? That's just that's just the way it works. The real thing that drives the fluctuations after an earnings announcement is the commentary, right? What is Apple saying about the future, or what did they not say, right, about the future? I, I, to me. When I kind of assess what's going on with the stock and what's going on in the stock market, and frankly compare it to say a company like mine, right, HP, which hasn't shown the growth that that we would like to, right, compared to Apple, mm -hmm. the big thing Apple has been struggling with here lately is for the last few years, as soon as people thought one product was maturing, boom, right, there came the next big leapfrog for Apple, right, going back from the iPod, the iPhone, the various generations of the iPhone, and the iPad. And they didn't hear any of that, right? In this last announcement, even though it was a record quarter again, all the comparisons the last year were up, right? Profit was up, everything was up. But they said, "Okay, what have you done for me lately? What, what do you have any? You know, you haven't announced any products. A January is going by, and nothing new from Apple. That's unusual." So I think 
what we're seeing here is a fear, right? That's what the stock stock market really is run on, by the way, a fear that they don't have a next huge play. And I believe that's why the stock is taking a hit, not institutional investor conspiracy, not because it was a bad quarter. It was lack of lack of inspired commentary about what's going to drive the next two or three quarters. Right? Yeah, one of the things that they say about the stock market is it's it really is your forward-looking predictor, and that these are the you know, stock is. markets your indicator of three to six months out. And I will say, Chris, if you just look at year over year. One year ago, 52 weeks ago, they were at 443. They closed today at 450. So, yes, they're up over where they were a year ago. Now, they're down well, from a high of 705. So Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I was, I was thinking about I listened to um, MacBreak Weekly yesterday for the first time in a month. And so, let's see, today is Thursday night as we're recording this. They record on Tuesday. Um, and so when they were recording it before the earnings report, it was at 500. It was flat at 500. So that's, that's the, the figure I'm remembering. So On Tuesday? They record on Monday or Tuesday. They record yeah, it before they were, the earnings report. Yeah, they were bouncing around in the 500s. They record yeah. on Tuesday. Yeah. So, but it, it's, um, I do think, if, since you're you know, speculating about Apple's future and things, I do think it stands as a, as a challenge for them that, um, um, there's there are expectations about what they produce and what they can do and um, and they've they've been fairly precise and careful they've had a limited product range with a high profit margin um, and it'll be interesting and in in, uh, to see is there a next big thing for them do they continue these incremental changes mm -hmm. and and it it does you know everybody still is is saying well without Steve Jobs there. There, there you go. This, are they going to do that? And there you it's go. like, well, you know, you know, the thing is, they haven't proven it, right? I think many, well, the, many in the investment community would argue that they haven't yet proven that they can do a next big thing without Steve. And I think well, until right, they right prove now, that, it, investors are going to be nervous. Sure, and and I think right now, though, every everything that does come out, everybody says, well, that was a Steve Jobs product. So we've got things in the pipeline for three to five years. So they're discounting. But what I was going to get to, Tony, is your point about the talk. Right, that at this point it, it doesn't really matter what the reality is, um, or I should put it the other way around. There, there is the concern that keeps being generated because everybody's waiting to see, everybody's speculating about something that only history will prove. Right, the well, only that's way what the market's all about. Right, the market is all speculative. Well, right, that's, right. that's what yeah. it's about. I was talking, yeah, I, mean, I meant verbal speculation, but yeah, your point taken. And one thing Steve Jobs was, in addition to what we typically talk about him being, he was great at building, you know, confidence in the investor community. Right? People had come to believe Steve will make sure the next home run, right, is there. And I think they're starting to worry, right, that that he's not there to do that. Uh, yeah. What's Tim Cook going to do, right? Tim Cook's over in China trying to get them to buy more iPhones. But to, to the investment community, that's hey, you're still trying to milk, <laughs> you know, okay. you're still trotting the basis from the last home run. <laughs> what are you going to do to hit another one? You're, and, and and I think all that is mounting on Apple, right? They haven't yet come up with that, uh, with the confidence in the in the investment community that says, yep, don't worry, that they've got something else that's going to drive future profitability. Well, and Apple's television. television. Uh, uh, well, you know, hey, just, just last week, you and I were having the conversation, Tony, where you know, I said, let's blue sky this, and we came up with the Apple car, where, in my mind, Hyundai or Toyota or maybe a Chinese car manufacturing company becomes the Foxconn for them in, in making an Apple car. But we were, we were saying, hey, there's all these great opportunities, whether it's television or something else, and now we're having a conversation of, is there going to be a next big thing? And one of the challenges Tim Cook's going to face is the longer he doesn't have that next big thing, the longer he doesn't have something that catches the imagination and really moves industry forward, the, the harder it's going to be for him to resist just throwing something out there to get it there. So where, where Steve Jobs was able to say, we're not going to release any iPad until it's time, Tim Cook may be under pressure to release something no matter what it is. And that, and that more than anything, could be a pressure that would backfire. Yeah. So a couple well, comments yeah, yeah, on that. Yeah. You remember the Eddie Bauer Ford vehicles? Yes. yes. Get an Eddie Bauer Expedition. You know, I could see there being an Apple version of the, you know, Lexus or whatever, right? I mean, 
They could do something like that. But, you know, that sounds crazy, but I think that's the type of thing the investment community is waiting but on. What is, is that it, next kind of outlandish thing that we all going to believe we need that we didn't know we needed, right? That's what Apple's been doing. Yeah, I think the branding, the rebranding thing, though, is, is usually seen as a sign of desperation. And True. when you get those sort of partnerships, <laughs> remember the, the uh, um, Chrysler Lamborghini, no, what was it, the Chrysler Maserati, I think it was, the Chrysler TC, Maserati TC, um, and the, uh, who was the notebook company that had Porsche, des a Lamborghini design or Ferrari design? That's not HP. It's, uh, yeah, I, it, it, yeah, I think you're right, Steve. Right at the end, you trailed off saying, I think that's a pressure that could backfire. I, I think you're absolutely right. He, he, Cook and the others may well be feeling pressure to push some, the next big thing out. But if they push something out that's half-baked and that isn't ready, that would be worse than waiting. That's true. That's, yeah, that's what, I was, that's what I was getting at. And, and you know, going back to the car thing, though, what we talked about last week is not just that they would brand it like the Eddie Bauer Ford Explorer, but that they would come up with an innovation in a car like, you know, yeah, Google's been test driving auto driving cars, but like every other Apple product, we've waited to do it right. And now you can buy the Apple automatically self-driving automobile, and we won't even necessarily tell you who manufactures it. It's Toyota, Hyundai, whatever. You know, but, but you know this car is done right. It's going to be a complete Apple-only product. And, and I'm just saying, saying if that... That could be the type of thing that could really catch the imagination, but if they they got to come up with something like that, and if but they can't rush it. That was kind of my point. Yeah, they can't rush it. And let's face it, Apple's profitability well, is so dominated by the iPhone right now, and that product is maturing, and so it's tough when companies you know look at Microsoft, right? Windows drove that company for so long, so profitable. Windows and Office, really. Now both of those products have essentially. Flatten, right? Maturity, right? They've saturated the market. They've gotten pretty mature. And I think Apple's now coming into that same situation, right, with these iDevices. The, the concept's maturing, and they haven't yet shown that there's anything else. Well, I have, I have two comments for you. One is, does anybody um, remember the origins of the smart car, which is now uh, built by Mercedes, Demler? You mean the car that's already gone through the trash compactor before you even purchase it? <laughs> yeah, the car, the car that was originally put forward by Swatch. Anybody remember Swatches? The Swiss watches, sure. yeah. The, yeah. The Swatch. yeah. So, so well, Swatch well, is, have you ever noticed how it's only driven by really large people? Yeah. They just, they just look, look, that, they just look yeah. that big. <laughs> the but, but, it's, but that actually is, uh, my recollection is that Swatch was actually the one driving it, pardon the pun, and had, I think, Volkswagen backing, and then eventually Mercedes sort of bought the whole thing because they saw the value of the idea, and then it moved away from Swatch. But it was in the late 80s, and this was when Swatch was a big brand, and they were trying to make this move. But I think I, my blue sky is actually going to be much more down to earth, to mix my metaphors. I, I think if the place where Tim Cook, where Apple should really go, and the place that they have never been very good at, for, not never, well, yeah, never really, aside from eWorld, they haven't been very good in the last 10, 15 years, is in the cloud and the integration. So they've sold the iPod through the iPhone initially, right, as this is the first step, then it becomes the last step in integrating your entire media life, everything is going to be associated around this. Your pictures, your, now it's your documents. Digital hub, remember that from Steve? The digital yeah. hub, right? And we all know how well the Apple services have worked. Crap. And it, that's... Yeah, yeah, Leo was saying just, the other, just in a, a couple weeks ago on, on This Week in Google that we all, those of you still on iPhones, generally don't use the Apple apps. You no. use Google apps for almost all those things like mail or or uh, music, you know, not music, but mail or, or oh, well, uh, maps so and those about, sorts of things. I don't know about that. I, I do not mind at all the, the Apple Mail app and Safari and so forth. But what I don't use, I use Dropbox for all my document handling. I use Evernote for my note taking and things like that. If, if Apple could really get that sorted. That, They're bad at it. Yeah. I, yeah, but if they could get it sorted, because they're still trying to be a, a company that sells notebooks, iPads, phones, desktops. If they really got that, that 
networking them all together down well, then you have no need to leave their ecosystem, right? If it's just another bit of hardware that I, that I lock into it, yeah, I mean, it's... So, anyway, that's my thought. Well, and, and, I, and, I, and I will say, Google here seems to be really making that play and doing it fairly successfully. You know, whether, whether you regularly use Google Plus or not, you're touching Google Plus almost every day, and those people that are in a Google system are really in the system. Because today, for instance, I had lunch with one of my former MBA students. He's a graduate now, and he works at a media company here. He was explaining how he's integrated against his IT comp IT's wishes integrated Google and all their processes to the point where he's innovated to use Google Calendar as kind of a, a, a replacement for Microsoft Project. He manages every major project that they're doing with different Google Calendars and then he has, because of all the different colors he gets, he's able to see them overlay and when certain things are, are hitting fruition and, and, and major pushes and those sorts of things and he shares that with his division. So. You know, Google has actually got some of those types of things out there. And well, so for them, well, it's well Steve, remember, remember a couple episodes ago where we talked about Leo, I hate to keep going back to Leo, but he makes some good points. Remember his speech at the New Media Expo, right, where he yes. talked about branding. Branding is for the who? He said branding is really for the ignorant, right? And when you look at the battle that's being waged between Apple Samsung primarily, to some degree Microsoft, the battle to sell that next phone, let's be honest, we're talking about the, the people now to sell that next phone, right? You're talking about, frankly, people who don't care about what we were just talking about, right? They are being influenced by the commercials, right? What their friends said about the phone, whatever. They're not like, oh, which phone should I pick to best integrate my calendar flow across? No, no, no. <laughs> that's not that's not what's selling that next phone, right, the way the market is now. And so I think you're going to see these companies continue to fight the battle on that front, which is, let's it's the superficial <laughs> layer, right, they're on now. Who can make maybe a cooler-looking phone? Who can come up with the hippest commercial that makes fun of the right party in the right way that sells that next phone? That's where the battle is now. Right. Well, and, no, and that's because there's parity. That's because there's parity in function now. Yeah, to a large degree. Or, or the stuff that differentiated now gets to where it's so uh, specialized that only the geeks care yeah. about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, you're, it, it's parity at kind of the average user level, right? So, yeah. well, and and that's, that's where the Chris companies right. are focused now, right? I think that's why Chris is right here, that if Apple's going to be able to sustain, they're going to have to move into that space that's not the phone, but rather is competing where, where Google seems to be gaining traction, which is people using the Google Docs, people using the calendar, people using the Google Maps and, and finding it to be more accurate and those sorts of things. And the fact that Google is able to uh, insinuate themselves, Chris, I may have used the incorrect word, but insinuate themselves yeah. into the Apple iOS infrastructure and ecosystem mm -hmm. in a way that puts their tentacles into there, whether they sell an Android phone or an iPhone, they're still getting, yeah. getting iPhone. It, it's no, starting I, I to matter it, less and less which phone you have, actually. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Steve. <laughs> it's starting I, to I matter think, less and less. I think Google's done very well at that, and I think it's a, it's a good strategy. And um, it's, it, you know, it is, um, the Google services, lots of people do like them. I'm always surprised at how many people don't. So our entire school system, uh, primary and secondary, use Google Docs. My daughter hates it. And all of her friends, we had this discussion with a bunch of her friends, they all hate Google Docs, which kind of surprises me. But it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, and you're right, insinuate is exactly the right word, Steve. They have, uh, Google has, has moved themselves in there, and Apple, with the whole Maps debacle, put themselves in a situation where they don't have a choice but to uh, but to allow Google Maps back in and, and everything else. By the way, as a, as a Google Plus, Google Chat Hangout question, is is the camera switching to me for you guys? Because yes, it is. Oh, okay, all right. But it's I for the consumer perspective, this is this is where we want to be, right? We've got more or less parity, not just parity at a low level. You've got parity at a high level with the things that we want. We've, we're, we've got services like Dropbox and Evernote and, and um, you know, mail services that can come from just about anywhere now, not just Gmail, but you can have your own service like we have, I have with Targoman.org through oneandone.com. I'm not getting anything from them. 
um, for, for but saying we, that. But we could if we could give. A, if anybody wants it, to get a one-on-one -on -one account, let us know. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, so that's nice because it does mean that I could go to a, a Samsung Galaxy 12s or whatever it's on now if I wanted, and. And aside from getting my music and podcasts synced over, which I do all that in iTunes right now, everything else would be pretty easy. I, I connect to my Dropbox account, um, connect to my, uh, my IMAP and Outlook account, and away I go. Yeah. You want to know something that, that's really interesting? You know, I think Apple may have made a mistake, though, with, with kind of disconnecting the, the iPhone and iPad from the Mac. Ah, oh, but Tony, that's, that's a good point. That was the other thing I was going to say. That's why I think, like, I'm somebody anybody should pay attention to on this. But hey, on you're on podcast. our show. Everybody uh, yeah. to pay attention. <laughs> that's why I think Apple needs to work on the networking, right? Yeah. Because they do still need to sell notebooks. They do still, still need to sell desktop computers on some level, even if they're not Mac Pros, you know. And so while they can sell those millions of phones, Ultimately, that's a gateway drug for them, I think. Right. They're going to make their higher margins elsewhere, and they're going to want to sell other services, and, and they're just letting themselves down. Steve, Tony, you guys are supply chain guys. Tim Cook is a supply chain guy. What do you think his background in that area brings that's different? Because a lot of people said he wasn't just in China he, to, to sell more iPhones. He was actually in China to figure things out so that they stop having the issues with with supply when they bring out new products and everything. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, when when Tim took Tim Cook took over, given his background, people said, you know, wow, Apple's now got a real execution guy at the helm. They're going to be great. And they've had more issues with supply <laughs> since he's been at the helm than I remember ever happening, you know, before. They can't get these new iMacs, the thin ones out. You know, they've had problems getting the iPhone 5 out in the volumes required. And recently here, they've had problems with with the iPad mini, which I don't understand, right? Because it's not using, you know, retina display. It's using basically the inside of an iPad uh, 2. Why can't they get those out the door, right? So I think Tim has really kind of let people down in terms of the, the supply-demand flow. My which is apparently why a lot of folks thought he was in China for that more so than the other. By the way, if anybody is looking at the video, my daughter just had this really cool bun that her friend put in, so that's what ah, we were doing okay, there. Okay. But, but I tell yeah. you what, you know, I thought you were going to say, hey, what is Tim Cook's background on the, 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 the whole networking piece? I don't know, right? Uh, he hasn't really shown anything there. But to me, I think it's been a mistake. I mean, I used to value the fact that you know, I had an iPhone, I also had an iMac, which ran iTunes better. I, I mean, the whole experience was better, Apple mobile device to Apple computer. Now, you know, with iCloud, one thing that they actually did do successfully is make it almost unnecessary for you to ever really connect your phone, right, to your laptop or desktop, mm -hmm. right? You can back up your phone to iCloud with iTunes Match, iTunes in the cloud. You don't really have to plug it in to get your get your music anymore. So I hardly ever use those two devices together anymore. And while that might be more convenient for me, for Apple, I think it is hurting that that it, that gateway drug effect you mentioned is lessened. You know, I, I think I've opened iTunes three times on my computer in the past six months, and every single time has been an accident. I mean, literally, I've clicked on Nikon by accident. And you don't need to. You don't need to Obviously, anymore. I have an Android, so I don't sync to it anyway. I mm -hmm. can play my Google Music. I stream a lot of what I do. I, I find myself more now turning audio on. This is weird. I turn audio on on my tablet or my phone on my desk, even though I have speakers on my computer. And yeah. I have no idea why I do that. <laughs> and well, you talk about it, ecosystems. It must, if I... I'm sorry. You're probably not listening. Well, I was gonna say you're probably not listening to music. I mean, I do that for podcasts and stuff. But well, actually, I do. Uh, have I picked eight tracks on, as a pick on this show yet? Uh, I, I listen to eight tracks a lot. Um, and you can I pick track to eight. Yeah, it's the number eight t r a c k s dot com. Oh, eight and basically, people curate music for you. They build a playlist, and you pick. You give it five or six or ten tags you want to use, like instrumental, um, study light, electronica, and it Chill. gives you a play mix that, that fits those, or contemporary Christian music, huh. holiday, whatever, and, and it plays Dumb curated stuff. lists. 
and I do that a lot. But you know, you mentioned the ecosystem, and you had an iMac, and you have this and a that. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to switch into our next topic real quick, which is Windows 8 pricing. But today, Tony, I had some text message exchanges with you, and and thank you for pointing me towards the NVX2 convertible for HP. I'm finding myself now so immersed in loving Office 2013 and Windows 8 that I want to go to that Windows 8 professional tablet experience so that I can have a lightweight full bore computer with a tablet with that experience that I can travel with me that's lighter quite honestly than my notebook computer and and I'm finding that staying inside that ecosystem the compatibility with Office 2013 especially as I've been working on this particular project uh, with this group I've been working on the ability to have that hardware and have that particular office set is very, very important to me in terms of an ecosystem. The fact that it doesn't have to match my tablet as far as my Android tablet or my Android phone or an iPhone, even better because I can choose the hardware I want for those other things because they're not tied into that, but I need that office experience. And I say all that to get to, hey, you're running out of time. By January 31st, you're gonna, you will no longer be able to get the $40 Windows 8 upgrade. So if you want to get oh, Windows 8 as an upgrade for thirty nine ninety nine, you got to get it by January thirty first. Um, and and I put that on our Real Tech for Real People on Facebook page, and already a couple people have commented on it. And I want to toss out there: Josh Finkelstein sends his sends his regrets for not being able to join us. He made a comment on Facebook that look, I'm loving Windows 8, and it's really easy to use. So that comes from Josh. So Jason, I know this means you're going to be rushing out and getting it. <laughs> Yeah, and if you get a DVD, by the way, you can go get it for seventy dollars for with a DVD, or it's forty dollars, thirty nine ninety five. If you buy it from Microsoft or their website, all you got to do is Google Windows Eight Microsoft Upgrade, and I think the very first thing at the top will be a paid ad. Microsoft is paying Google to to push that to the top of the Google search. Hmm. Uh, but uh, and I tell you this, Chris, you remember Marianne um, Fossilino? Yeah, uh, I was. Hesitated on the last name, but yeah, she. Um, oh, sorry, should I not have said yeah, that? Yeah, you know what? I thought okay. you were searching for the. Uh, Twelve of our listeners are gonna like now stalk her forever. Uh, she commented on Facebook that she upgraded to Windows 8, and she had a couple glitches in, uh, in terms of it didn't move everything over from her Vista account because she was still using themes from ten years ago. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, really? <laughs> Um, so she's going to have to get some new themes. I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I think Spread HDGFX could come up with some nice Penn State themes if you want them. But, uh, you know, even, even she's moving up, and, and she was the reason I pointed out to people you can still get it for $40. And, and so uh, Heather Thomas's family, they're looking at upgrading and a few of the others now because they got, they got days. You got, what, six days? Mm. If I can do my math right? Mm -hmm. Five days? Six days. If you start tonight. So, well, I don't have any Microsoft news for you, other than Outlook. Microsoft Outlook on Mac is giving me fits with Gmail, or is Gmail as a whole having problems with people, or people having problems with it? I should say that was that was that was going to be my. I was, was going to call in. I was going to call in for tech help. Yeah, I've been no. For me, Gmail has been a little flaky lately. A couple times it was it wasn't responding, but I didn't know if it was my connection or. For them. Yeah, so maybe okay, I'm, I'll give you a three for three on this one then, because while Gmail is working fine for me, the accounts that I've linked to Gmail are just in the dumper, totally down to the dog here. Mm -hmm. Not well, maybe working. there is something going on then. Um. Hey, uh, speaking of other Microsoft news, though, have you guys heard about the, the dance going on between Microsoft and Dell? Matter of fact, someone just Google talked me on this. Yeah. And they said, what do you think of Microsoft buying Dell? Is it, what's the story here? I had, I had not heard. To me, this is a newsflash. Well, they're not really buying Dell, but, I mean, first of all, I think the, the base story is, you know, Dell is in trouble, right? Dell, the darling of the, the 90s, right, is now in big, big trouble. And I think the one thing Dell um, is coming to grips with is, you know, they didn't diversify quickly enough, right, when it became clear that, the PC industry was going to slow down, right? They, they kind of stayed focused on selling lots of PCs, and they did that for a while, right? But now that we're seeing the slowdown and increased competition from the likes of Lenovo and Acer and others, Dell's, Dell's really, really been having 
a tough time. And so word is, even Michael Dell now, who came back, by the way, right, founder Michael Dell came back to retake the Came back to save the, the company, to pull a Save the jobs. company is now kind of leading the charge, saying we need to take the company private, basically, you know, retrench. And Microsoft is apparently uh, involved in trying to make that happen also. Very, very interesting when you just think of the the rise and fall of Dell that way. It's very, very surprising to me that in such a short time they could be in that situation. Yeah. yeah that, well, if we want to talk about the other rising star in the 90s, um, Gateway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Who? <laughs> they were my computer. They were my go-to computer company. Of Are, aren't Gateway? Aren't Gateway, Packard Bell, E Machine? Aren't they all part of Acer now? They're all part of Acer. So. Yeah. 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 Swallowed by Acer of all people. Remember Compaq? Well, it was Gateway 2000. You don't. You know they didn't have a plan. Remember, I said they didn't have a plan to get into the 21st century. Yeah, they <laughs> were there. They were there to carry it <laughs> until then, and then we're done. Make your money and leave. Yeah. Oh, uh, so this is great. I, uh, by the way, the person in Google Talk is telling me that if I just read the Wall Street Journal, I'd have known about this article <laughs> and the story about IBM and Wall Street Journal. Don't all professors tell you to read the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, they, sure. they do. That's why I'm not a professor anymore. <laughs> just toss that one out there. Do as I say, not as I do, right? That's, that's what do as I don't do anymore. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> the way I look at it. You know, the other thing I wanted to bring up here in, in, in talking about Windows 8, as we, as we go in Microsoft and Windows 8, is for a tip to start off with in the tip section, for those of you that are using Windows 8, this is one that it, it's going to be hard for me to remember, but once I've started using it, it's becoming easier and easier. You know, remember that you, you, you have to like right-click on computer and then click on properties to get the device manager setting, or you have to go to the control panel and do this. If you go down to the bottom left in Windows 8 and right-click in the bottom left-hand corner of the desktop, it brings up a long list of very useful shortcuts, including device manager. In the desktop mode you're talking about. In desktop uh, mode, right. Files, okay. You can go to control panel, system, programs and features. Uh, you go into the device manager settings. You can get this very long list of things you might want to go to. Now, they're all system things, you know, things you would want to do if you want to manipulate the system itself and, and make sure your drivers are installed and, and see how the devices are working or, or add and delete programs, that sort of stuff. But... It is so simple and easy to use, and I'll, I'll have a tag on tip here. One of the other things you can do is you can just drag your mouse in the bottom left-hand corner when in the desktop mode, and it brings up the whole start screen, the Metro start screen or the tile start screen. Well, if you try to do that on a Windows tablet, it's not going to work right. Uh, you have to be doing that with the mouse. On the Windows tablet, though, what you'll do is you'll just slide from the right over, from outside the right, slide in with your finger to slide it in, and you'll get a... a uh, charms bar, bar, as they call it, a bar of charms or links, and dead center, and that will be the start button to get to that start screen or that main Windows tab. So if you have Windows 8, you've got that nice little shortcut. You can, If you have a Windows 8 tablet, very few people do. That's a nice way to get to the start screen, and that's the very one thing few that people me do. For. Why is that? That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. Uh, yeah, we need to get more of those out there, but. You know, let's take that for a second. Why do you think right, we didn't see a rush of people to buy Windows 8 tablets? I mean, Microsoft was betting we would, weren't they? Well, my take on it is it's because we most places understand, most large purchasers understand the difference between Windows RT and Windows 8 Pro on tablets. So they held off? You know? I, I, I will tell you that all of the IT guys, oh, we have two. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also a couple of the other guys I've talked with, they said the same thing, which they're interested in it, but they're not going to bother looking at it until the pro comes out. So, wow. so to, me, to me, it was a marketing bust by Microsoft. To me, well, maybe that's... even calling it Windows 8 was not the right move because right. we all rushed out and bought this crap called iOS something or other that had touch and... Oh, wow, this is great. I think because they called it Windows 8, people were like, well, you know, Windows 7 kind of does what I need. I don't know. And now it's touch. I don't use touch. I think the close association between pe what people consider the Windows experience and what Microsoft is trying to now do, I think they should have done something similar to what Apple did, right? You had Mac OS 10, and then you had iOS. Right. It was just, I, well, just puts your mind in a whole 
different gear, right? I think Microsoft trying to pound its Windows, its Windows, its Windows, I don't think that's served it well, right? Because I think it's a better product than the consumption would indicate, but I think people are, frankly, yeah, I do think people are confused by what the heck Microsoft's trying well, to do here. It, it's a really good point, Tony. It's interesting because, of course, the iOS was much different and still is in many ways than the Mac OS. I mean, they're, they're explicitly trying to merge the two. The marketing problem I see, and there are all sorts of other things that people are talking about, but um, Microsoft continually does this. They give you lots of SKUs, so to speak, right? They give you... They, they announce that it was, this RT is coming out, but they also let you know the pros coming. Apple doesn't give you that many choices, and a lot of people hate them for it, but you, you had this iOS device, or you didn't, and it was simple. But with Microsoft, like I said, we've got IT guys who are very interested in, in getting them, but they're not getting anything until they have a chance to get the pro, mm -hmm. and then enthusiasm <coughs> tends to wane. And I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, Tony, the thing you, you shared with me today, was it the X2, the NVX2, which mm -hmm. is a full-up Windows 8, full Windows 8 notebook, but it's a convertible that the actual screen detaches like you would see with, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot like what the Surface does, except it's got a real keyboard and extra battery and everything else in the base. Right. You know, that's going to be the type of arrangement. Now, I know when I was talking to the folks at the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, just a visit, um, and we were talking about the fact they walked into this meeting with stacks of paper. They were looking forward to a real honest-to-goodness Windows tablet coming out because then all of that stack of paper will be compressed down into you know, a, a little tablet they can carry with them that is 100% compatible with the desktop on their desk and the, and the notebook that they travel with and, and all the, the productivity tools that they're using in the office space. And so... Yeah, I, I think, if anything, we're going to see the growth when Windows 8 Professional, Surface 8 comes out, or Surface Pro, or whatever it's going to be called, and the HP tablet that's coming, and the uh, the Samsung tablet, and those those are the one, whichever ones are actually going to be coming out. Uh, yeah, I think they just shot themselves in the foot with RT altogether. I do, too. I don't even know what the heck they were trying to accomplish with RT. I don't think many people did. They clearly didn't sell many of them. You know, uh... The, I will this say will that go, this will go down under a lot of of uh, scrutiny. I think in terms of what went wrong with the the Windows 8 launch, in my opinion. Well, I will say we we have five times as many viewers of our "What's Really Windows RT" episode on YouTube than we've had on any of our other episodes. Just significantly not larger numbers. And you tell you, so I'm going to say that, that that means that we had a strong hand here in helping people understand why they didn't want to buy RT. <laughs> why they I'm didn't. thinking <laughs> RTFRP probably had more to do with syncing RT than anything else. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, we should have played off that a little bit more. Hey, I, I did put this one in here, Chris. I don't know if you'd seen this, or Tony, if you'd seen this, a Mac user's tip. Uh, handbrake is a really cool tool for love uh, handbrake. Yeah, so well, it's back uh, now. Handbrake was not working with the latest update of VNC and everything for a while. So I was really pleased about two months ago to find out that it was back up and running. So what does handbrake do? Why don't you quickly tell our viewers and yeah. listeners what that is? Um, uh, I, I think I mentioned in the pre-show I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> it it uh, it takes a DVD and converts it into a format you can use on your computer. Uh, it has presets for various iOS devices, and so I, things that I own, for example, getting them uh, such that I can stream it to my Apple TV, since my DVD drive is broken on my uh, with my uh, TV. So. Um, and I, it looks like, Steve, this, I haven't heard of this uh, batch, uh, handbrake batch, but it sounds like it makes it go faster. Well, handbrake batch, I found this, uh, I think I saw it on Lifehacker. I'm not sure, but I think I did. Uh, yep, handbrake right. batch lets you process batches faster, so you ah. can have a large series of files you want to convert. Because not only does it... Yeah, it'll convert anything. It doesn't have to be on a DVD. Yeah, not only does oh, it okay. archive your purchased DVDs to allow you to have secure archived copies, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it will also allow you to batch process and convert fi any different uh, files from MP4 to AVI to whatever. And so you know, I'm, I may pull in five or six videos off of my Sony cam uh, HD camera, for instance, 
you know, my, my digital SLR that does HD video and it comes in as one format and I want to save it as another and I want to batch process them, it lets me do that. Handbrake batch for the Mac uh, is a much, much faster way of doing batch processing. So you can just batch it all together and run it through. It's just kind of a Mac tip that I found that I thought you nice. guys might actually like. Yep. That's yeah, Handbrake's awesome. I love the fact that it has presets for all the iPods, all the iPhones, yep. Apple TV. That way you just sit and you know it'll play on them, right? A lot of things usually go wrong with that with other products where you encode it, you wait two hours and you're like, crap, it won't play on this, right? So it's, <laughs> it's great that you know it'll play on a particular device with Handbrake. That's the, that's the best feature I think it has. Well, if raise, your hand, raise your hand if you've encoded a video only to find that it wouldn't play on the device you want to play it on. Always oh, seems yeah. to happen. Yeah. From time. I need more hands. <laughs> <laughs> that that encoding takes a long time, and you're like, oh, yeah, nothing. Well, Steve, if we're on tips, I wondered, could I step out of the usual and uh, offer a um, a sort of workflow tip that I think will work? Uh, you can tell me what wh how to work it on uh, on Android. I saw but, this here, and I'm dying to hear how you do this. Okay, so. Um, I realized this first when I was trying to read a 600-page document for a review I was doing of another honors college. And um, I was using I annotate PDF on the, uh, the iPad, but any, any PDF reader that allows you to annotate. And uh, realized what I could do is I could just click the comment button, you know, to create my little balloon for the comment. And in the iOS, I have Siri on my iPad. So I just, you know, click on Siri, I dictate my note, click end, it converts it to, to text, and I move on to the next one. How do, you do, how do you do that in there? When you're in the little bubble balloon, does the little mic show up there? Well, it's the key, you know, the keyboard shows up, oh, um, it's got the, okay, and I wish okay, I could okay. screen share, you know, my iPad. But so when the keyboard comes up, the little microphone's there. You have, the have, mic. okay. yeah, you have to have a, an iPad that supports it or, or an iPhone, frankly. Uh, you can also do the same thing, of course, on your Mac. Um, now, with the latest uh, operating system on the Mac, it has voice recognition built in uh, for text recognition. And I know that Windows and Android have had that for, for a long time. So um, what I, one of the things for me was realizing as I had 14 essays to grade uh, at the end of my class, I, they all came in as Word docs. I just converted them all to PDFs, and I was able very quickly, and for me, I was able to give my students far more comments and feedback than I would have if I had had to sit there and type it all in, even typing it in, let alone handwriting it. Um, so it really works across all platforms now. Again, it sort of goes back to our comment about um, uh, Apple maybe losing some of its cachet because the consumers have got real parity now. In this particular area, Apple lagged behind Windows and Android. So I'm, I'm now looking at I'm, I'm looking at the one I use, which is um, uh, Easy PDF. And mm -hmm. sure enough, if I go to the annotate feature, it brings up the keyboard. Yeah. And down here on the keyboard, at least in my Swift key, if I hold down the uh, the button, it brings up the voice dictation aspect to it. And it yeah. starts typing it in even as I talk. I mean, this is really quite good as it goes. Yeah. So, so they're all kind of using that standard input interface, which on the new devices includes the voice. Yeah. So yeah. if I bring it up here, you can see it's actually it actually typed in as I was talking. It's still bringing it in. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. The now the Apple uh, the Siri doesn't do that. That's for sure. Um, but it's it's. Um, yeah, I'm, I won't bother trying to hold it up to the camera. Nobody will be able to see it. But anyway, you know the the, the point I like is this if, new if, camera. <laughs> if you if you play around with um, if you play around with with whatever your device is, my guess is you'll be able to uh, to there'll be if you get a PDF reader or something like that that has common function, and take a look at the um, voice. In fact, Steve, I was talking to our mother, who uh, was sending me very cryptic emails. I don't know if you had noticed these in Facebook messages that. Uh, you know, our mother's hands uh, has very arthritic hands, and I said, 
why don't you, you know, the iPad 2 has voice recognition, has the Siri on it. She goes, well, that's your father's. And I said, take it away from I him. I got, <laughs> she it. has a Galaxy <laughs> S3. It has that, that, that voice recognition yeah. you just saw that talk types as you talk, and I've showed her how to use the button because this is real tech for, I can't believe these people can't figure this out. Yeah, if you yeah, press yeah. the button and you say, call Chris, yep. and nine times out of ten, it's going to be you. Right. Although you, you are, your full name is in my uh, contact, Steve. So for years, with every system that I've had, all the way back to my Motorola Razor, which used to have voice activated, you're Stefan Brady. Yeah, thanks, dude. That's, thank mom. <laughs> thank mom. Oh, yeah. In fact, I got a phone call today. Speaking of technology, I got a phone call from XM Radio telling me that the card on file expired in 2011. And I owed them money, and if I wanted to continue getting service, I needed to give them a new credit card number over the phone. And I was like, I think I'll take care of this online. Well, sir, while I have you click, I hung up on them, and I, and I logged on. Sure enough, the card they had, had had expired. But, you know, I'm like, this is about as good a scam as any I've heard. 2011, though. That's, yeah, so you must have paid for a couple of years at a time. I must have. I don't know what the deal was there. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Uh. Well, I, I, as an aside, when uh, SiriusXM calls us, so they did one of these deals, and it was, I don't know, $25 for three months. And we had some road trips ahead, and my wife's car has it, and so I went ahead and, and got it. And then it came time to expire, so I had set my calendar, so I called them up, and I said, it's just too expensive. And they said, well, how about if we gave you another six months or whatever for $25? And I said, well, yeah, okay, that I'll do. What I wish they would do is their lifetime is like, I don't know, four or $500. It's ridiculously... I didn't even know they had a lifetime, do they? Yeah, yeah, or wow. they used to. I haven't looked at it in a while. Wow. But, you know, they're, they're, if they would come up with a more reasonable lifetime cost, not only would I get that, I'd probably go ahead and get another receiver to put in my other car. Yeah. If it weren't, you know, they, I, their pricing options just baffle me. Well, I will tell you, I, I found out XM Series has a la carte pricing now. So if you want to just uh -huh. get talk and sports, nine ninety nine a month. Oh, wow. That's, of, that's really what I listen awesome. to the most. Yeah. Well, one of the things that they took out were NFL games, I discovered. Yes, they did. So my basic package doesn't have NFL games. I was not no, happy I never, I that. never had NFL games. Well, they used oh, to. I take that back. I take that back. You know they what? Serious talk. But uh, they, they have a la carte, but you have to have specific radios for a la carte yeah. to work. You know, before they merged, Sirius had the NFL. And I, I was always on XM, and I was like, crap, you know. Uh -huh. can't get. But when they merged, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I can't get <laughs> NFL anymore. Oh, go Ravens. Go Ravens. Hmm. Just saying. Yeah, there you go. Got to root for the older brother. <laughs> I would have been really upset to find out the San Francisco guy was the older brother because I would have been torn because I really want to root for the Ravens. <laughs> you and that older brother stuff. Okay. I got it. I caught up. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Tony, do you have siblings? I have two younger sisters. Oh, two younger sisters. Yeah. I don't know. I, something about younger siblings. We're just not that bothered by it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, real quick, I hate to do this, guys, but I actually have a hard stop tonight. But I wanted, I'm going to skip my photo tip because, Chris, you had a really good one that works, I think, with uh, most digital SLRs just differently. Okay, well, that's fine. I wasn't sure. We could always save it. But um, it's a pro tip that I uh, literally got from the pros that we often hire here at the university. And um, on the back of most digital SLRs, there's a button somewhere around where your thumb would be, and it's for either auto exposure or auto focus lock. And in my Nikon, you can go in and you can set what function that's going to be. And so what they recommended, especially for sports photography, is at that thumb position, set that as the autofocus lock so that the trigger is now just for trigger. So it means two. <laughs> exactly. There, there, there are two benefits. Sorry, Roy. <laughs> One is when I have a 300, my 300 millimeter lens, which is a great lens, but it's, it's a little slower focusing than... I mean, because it's not a $6,000 300 millimeter lens, so it's slower focusing. And when I'd be taking pictures, say, of Mac, he's the goalkeeper, so he doesn't move a whole lot. So I'd set my, uh, my depth of field appropriately. I could focus in on him, let go of the focus button. 
I could keep shooting, and even if somebody, a kid, ran in front of him, that area would still remain in focus. Um, and uh, so, and then the other thing is when you press it down and hold it, it acts just like a regular focus button without you having to inadvertently fire off uh, shots. So um, you, you'll need to look in your menus a little bit, take a look at your camera. It may not be at all levels of, of your cameras, um, but it, it's, a, it's a nice handy tip, and I've since found out that, that most pros, especially shooting sports, have a tendency to use this because it allows them to, to keep separate fingers for separate functions. So. Yeah, and we'll say the, the only thing more annoying than uh, having somebody walk in front of an autofocus or run in front of you and autofocus you out of your focus zone is probably what you said is the other thing, which is forgetting you've switched it over. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're just trying to take a regular shot and it's out of focus. It's like, it won't yeah. focus. Okay. So remember what you've done, but otherwise, great one. Uh, like I say, I hate to cut this short, but uh, we run to our picks real quick. I'm just going to throw mine out there. It's a quick one. It's Flipboard for Android tablet. I think I mentioned before it's finally out. I'm living with it now. I'm liking it, and I even put it in that uh, that BlueStacks app I talked about last week that runs Android on the Windows and the Mac desktop. I'm using that and TweetDeck, not TweetDeck, um, TweetCaster, my favorite Twitter app. I'm using both of those on my desktop now in the Android version running on my desktop because I like the app interface that I get there. So I guess kind of a way of saying maybe I like the idea of Metro I just won't admit it, and I'm going to do it by using Android. But Flipboard for Android, Flipboard for Android tablet, my pick. Nice. Well, Chris? my quick, real quick, my pick, real quick. Um, in the past, we used to use for our podcast something called Delicious with tags. So when we ran across a great story, we tag it. Delicious still exists, and it's actually in a new version. It's actually quite good. But I'm trying to share stories I come across with my class that I'm teaching. And I realized Evernote, which we know and love, we've talked about on here before, it's sharing... <laughs> What's that? Jason Leisure. <laughs> okay. Sharing folders used to be a real pain. Now it is easy and elegant. So I'm using Evernote where I can not only have uh, URLs and links in there, but even my own notes in, in commentary and stuff I can include. And I have just a single link. I put it on my blog for my students, and I say, you really ought to check this once or twice a week to see what I'm reading and what questions I'm asking you about the things that I'm reading. So share, not just Evernote, but look at their shared folders feature. Yeah, and you mentioned Delicious. I'm not sure if you've noticed, Chris, but I'm using Delicious with an RTFRP tag uh -huh. to right. uh, tag stuff for the show here, and I'm actually using If This Then That to save it. So if you go to, you should have a shared document called Show Notes, and whenever I tag something with If This Then That, and, and tag something in Delicious, If This Then That sticks it in that document. But if you all tag something RTFRP, you use that for a tag. And listeners, if there's something you want us to see, tag it with RTFRP and we'll see it uh, and talk about it in the show perhaps. Tony? Well, my pick is related to how we started the show. John Gruber has lost his mind. So if you're <laughs> looking for uh, another great site to follow a rational view of what's going on in the, the iOS ecosystem, all the devices, iPads, iPhones, iPods, etc., I recommend checking out imore.com. The team there is led by Renee Ritchie, who's now a regular on MacBreak Weekly on, tweet, on Twit. But I think he does a good job of being kind of rational. He's a rational, he's a rational reasonable, fanboy. Yeah, and he gives a, a pretty reliable view on what's going on. So if you're, if you're souring on the likes of John Gruber and are looking for another outlet for that, I recommend uh, Renee's imore.com. Yeah, I think Scott Bourne has just so disappeared we needed a new Scott Bourne and so Gruber is filling in. <laughs> <laughs> Admirably, yes. And, well, and, nice. I, and I think Renee is kind of like the uh, 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 hot dog ladies. Uh, yeah. Merlin? No, well, can Merlin I just... man, yeah. He's kind of a Merlin man. Now. Merlin man, yeah. Before, before we go, Steve, I just wanted to thank you all again for all your support and let you know that um, some of the listeners know we... Um, we established a scholarship in Max Honor um, for the led, soccer led team. Led the show last week, and we are over seventy thousand dollars in less than three weeks of it being right. established. It's right. it's humbling and it's unbelievable. Folks have been tremendous, so we're very that's grateful for everyone hear. there that's and great to hear. for all their prayers and support too. So, but it's that's just all that is is as we say an outward and visible sign of all the support and love that we've been receiving, and we're very grateful. 
And you were saying most of the donations were small, right? That uh, yeah, most of them are well under, um, you know, certainly under five hundred dollars, and mostly hundred dollars, and a couple hundred dollars, fifty dollars, twenty-five dollars, and uh, a number that came in a week ago, a week or so ago, at, at the soccer clinic that the that the soccer team, the Penn State soccer team, put together in a matter of, of days. We had several big checks for several hundred dollars, and it was the kids from these teams and their parents putting their money together and bringing the check as a team, and a number of them gave us cards that were signed by, and these were teams from Pittsburgh and Altoona and all these places that we had played against, and they remembered Mac from when we played against them, and it was it, very humbling. Yeah, the things they probably said about Mac, they're trying to take back now, <laughs> that's right? right? That's right. Curse yeah. that goalie that stopped my son's kick. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, so. I mentioned last time to go to engage.sht.psu, Edu, but is there a better place that uh, our viewers and listeners can go to, to donate? That has that has the story, but if they you know if they really want to give the scholarship, it's just givenow.psu.edu. It's not a great website. I've told them about that, but givenow.psu.edu, and at some point you'll be able to say what you want it for: Mac Brady Scholarship. Oh, great! So, yeah, thank you all. And you know, Tony, normally we'd say that that tech was real, but I have to say that tonight, that this life that he's living and that we live is real. That's real. Amen, brothers, and I will talk Amen. to you Amen. all later. Good. All right. Thanks for letting me in, guys. <laughs>